It was one of the defining moments of the second Iraq war. Art historians call it the desecration of civilization. For three days in April 2003, looters rampaged in the storerooms and galleries of Iraq's National Museum, making off with some 15,000 priceless objects. American troops had no order to intervene and stood by as Iraq's heritage was plundered. One Iraqi official called the looting, quote, the crime of the century because it affects the heritage of all mankind. One memorable moment that week was when Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld dismissed the looting in Baghdad as unimportant. Freedom's untidy, and free people are free to make mistakes and commit crimes and do bad things. Christopher Woods, a leading University of Chicago scholar of Sumerian language and writing, says a moment like the looting of the Baghdad Museum has lasting effects on the relationship between Iraq and the U.S. These cultures are very old and they're very proud. It's, I think, hard for Americans to sort of wrap their minds around the great antiquity of these civilizations and the pride they have in that antiquity. Imagine, for instance, how we would feel if the National Archives were looted, if the Constitution was burned. Wood says when archaeology and politics intersect, archaeological investment becomes a kind of statecraft. Yeah, it's, it's interesting, and I, I don't think many people have an appreciation for this. Woods is the director of the Oriental Institute at the University of Chicago. The OI is one of the world's foremost research centers on the civilizations of the ancient Near East. For years, it had maintained archaeological digs in Iraq until the Gulf War pushed them out of the country. But now, as the OI marks its 100th anniversary of its founding, Woods wants to go back. It was one of my goals when I uh, became director to resume excavations in southern Iraq. I'm a Sumerologist, so naturally this is something I'd want to do. Sumer is in, in southern Iraq, and the political climate seems to be evolving in a way that's uh, allowing us to resume our work there. If the looting of the Baghdad Museum is on one end of the archaeology as statecraft spectrum, the OI's plan to resume excavations in southern Iraq is on the other. So the, the people that we encounter in these countries, they're enormously grateful uh, for our interest in their culture. They appreciate what we're doing. They appreciate that we're making it known to the world. They appreciate that we're protecting their civilizations, the, these, their ancient heritage, that we have an investment. We have a personal and professional investment in their heritage. From the University of Chicago, this is Big Brains, a podcast about the stories behind the pivotal research and pioneering breakthroughs that are reshaping our world. On this episode, Christopher Woods and Archaeology is Statecraft. I'm your host, Paul Rand. Although the Oriental Institute is responsible for some of the most important archaeological finds in the world, many people haven't heard of the OI, but they certainly have heard of one of its most famous academics, someone we've met on this podcast before. Hello, Marion. Indiana Jones. <sighs> Always knew someday you'd come walking back through my door. That's right, yeah. Well, this is a big part of OI lore, something that the OI we're very proud of. Indiana Jones, the character of Indiana Jones, was inspired by likely two OI professors, one James Henry Breasted, and the other probably Robert Braidwood. Now, you studied under <laughs> Professor Ravenwood at the University of Chicago. Yes, I did. Ravenswood may be a play on Braidwood, but this sort of this idea of this of swashbuckling archaeologists traveling throughout the Middle East and encountering all sorts of adventures uh, really goes back to Breasted. Of course, James Henry Breasted's legacy goes far beyond inspiring famous movie characters. He's also responsible for pioneering modern archaeological studies and founding the Oriental Institute in 1919. Breasted really had a radical idea at the time, and that was that a civilization didn't begin in Greece and Rome, as many people assume, but really that it began in the Middle East, in an area that he vividly called the Fertile Crescent. And what did he mean when he talked about the Fertile Crescent? So he's speaking of the arc of uh, settlement, early settlement, that extends from uh, Egypt to Mesopotamia, basically. So Mesopotamia is essentially ancient Iraq. The term Mesopotamia basically is a Greek term that means between the rivers, and that refers to the, the Tigris and Euphrates rivers, which um, are the life 
veins of Mesopotamian civilization. So I wonder, would we think about our own story mm-hmm. uh, and the story of civilization? Mm-hmm. How does understanding what, what's going on in the Fertile Crescent trace back, change our thinking, enhance our thinking? You know, I would start off by saying that people have a fascination with what's beyond the here and now. Whether it's space, deep space, or the beginnings of, of the, the cosmos, or the Jurassic period. And with that, people have a, a fascination with their own origins. Just consider the, the craze in DNA ancestry. Absolutely. What we have in the ancient Middle East, it's part of our origin story. This is the place where um, humans created the first villages, where the domestication of plants and animals first took place, where the first cities arose, where the first empires arose. You also have these landmarks in technology uh, that really form the basis of today's world. Uh, for instance, writing was invented in the ancient Middle East, right? Okay. This is many people identify, rightly or wrongly, it's debatable, civilization with writing, right? Writing is a a cornerstone of civilization. Well, writing was invented for the first time in the Middle East. You know, in some cases, what was created in Mesopotamia directly influenced our world. So if you look at your watch and you see that the the minute is divided into 60 seconds, the hour into 60 minutes, the circle into 360 degrees, well, this all goes back more than 5,000 years to to Sumer, in, uh, where they used, the Sumerians used a uh, sexagesimal or base 60 counting system. What we have in Mesopotamia is you could look at it as the first data point, right? And it's so well documented because of writing. So we have this very early data point for civilization, and we have copious documentation in terms of the archaeological record, but also writing. If you look at Mesopotamia, for instance, where they wrote with cuneiform on clay tablets, and you can dig up a clay tablet today and read it as well as you could 4,000 years ago. And so you have all of this, okay. all of this data. Well, these civilizations were lost. They really were only discovered in the middle of the 19th century. So um, no one really knew what was under the sands of Iraq and Syria and Iran up until basically the 19th century. And the first sort of systematic, uh, they're more sort of like treasure hunting um, expeditions, really, but they were fairly systematic at that point. Excavations began in the 18, 1850s, 1860s. But when World War I ended and the Ottoman Empire collapsed, it opened up the entire Middle East to Western scholarship in a way that it hadn't been before. And there was this, this notion that Breasted had, it was almost sort of part of the, of the war effort, in fact, that it was America's responsibility now to, to occupy this intellectual space that had been the purview of Western Europe, which had been decimated by the war. And just in the same way that Americans had sort of bailed out uh, Europeans in the war, they should now really stake the, the American flag in the Middle East and carry on the tradition of Middle Eastern scholarship that the British and the French had uh, established in the 19th century. So you know, the OI, we've excavated dozens of sites from Tunisia to Iran. And many of these sites have really become sort of the the standard bearers for their for their fields. Okay. They create the sort of the stratigraphy, the history of these settlements because they were excavated in such incredible detail. You look at places like Megiddo, which is known in by its Greek name, it'll be familiar to some, Armageddon, which uh, exposed 5,000 years of civilization there. Um, Nippur, another site where the OI had excavated for for nearly 50 50 years. Since the 40s, right? Yeah, 48 to 1990. Nippur is very important because it was the religious capital of early uh, Mesopotamia. The head deity of the Sumerian pantheon, a god named Enlil, he called Nippur his his house. He called it his city, and his main temple was there. He had a ziggurat, which is a Mesopotamian stepped uh, pyramid. It's still it's still there. You know, not in great shape after four thousand years, but it's still there. 
So Babylonian kings, Assyrian kings of the first millennium, they all would pay homage to Nippur. They would uh, lavish gifts on Nippur. They would create massive building projects in Nippur. You could think of Mecca or, or Rome and, and the success of cities like that. And also because it was a religious capital, it was also spared some of the ravages of war that undid uh, many other Mesopotamian cities. So it's a very special place. You know, wherever you have religion in Mesopotamia, in temples, you have great scribal activities. And Nippur is also famous for its textual record. This is the main source we have for Sumerian literature. Some you know, 30 to 40,000 texts have been excavated from, from Nippur. And we owe a great deal of our knowledge of the world's earliest literature, Sumerian literature, to what was found at Nippur, what was copied out by, by scribes in the, the time period between roughly 2000 BC and 1800 BC. And we're actually returning to our, uh, returning to Iraq to excavate Nippur. It can't be overstated how historic this return to excavation in Iraq really is. The Fertile Crescent runs right through Southern Iraq and many archeologists haven't been there in decades. For people like me, when I entered the field, we were already in the midst of the first Gulf War. Something is happening outside. Um, the skies over Baghdad have been illuminated. Just two hours ago, Allied Air Forces began an attack on military targets in Iraq and Kuwait. These attacks continue as I speak. If there was any hope of returning to the dig sites in Iraq after the Gulf War, they were crushed in 2003. My fellow citizens, at this hour, American and coalition forces are in the early stages of military operations to disarm Iraq, to free its people, and to defend the world from grave danger. North of Baghdad, near the Kurdish town of Kifri, massive pre-dawn explosions lit up the sky. The constant heavy bombing by U.S.-led forces continued into the morning. The second war in Iraq has meant that archaeologists have only been able to study Mesopotamia from afar, which when you're dealing with physical artifacts can be quite difficult. For my generation and even the, the generation that's come after me, studying ancient Mesopotamia was almost like studying you know, an extrasolar planet. You did it in a library, you did it with museum collections, you didn't actually go there. And only now in the last few years you can, go. can we go there. And, and it blows your mind if you've studied something like this for 20 years and you've never been there. It's incredible to go to uh, Iraq, to go to Nippur, to walk up the, the ziggurat of Enlil, something that you had studied for 20 years, to read inscriptions on site that you've only read in photographs and in copies, to go to Uruk, which is the world's first city, um, to see this firsthand is an absolutely incredible experience. Um, we went last year to the marshes. This, these are in southern Iraq near the, Kuwait, uh, the Kuwaiti border. And there in the marshes, there's a lifestyle that's existed with minor change for the last 5,000 years. The houses that we see in the artwork, the reed houses called Mudif houses, that you see in the artwork from the time Exist of the first today. cities, yeah, from 3200, wow. 3, 3000 BC, wow. those same houses, that same structure, reed structures, they still build that way. And to go there uh, and see this firsthand is really, is really incredible. You read in, in Sumerian literature all the time about birds and bird songs. They play a very important role in, in Mesopotamian literature. And when you go to the marshes, you can understand that when you hear just being out in the marshes and experiencing the marshes and having this union with antiquity is really is really incredible. And the ability to go back is, is really wonderful. And Wood says the OI's return to Iraq is about more than just new historical discovery. He has a phrase, Archaeology is statecraft. We'll explore what that means after the break. If you're listening to Big Brains, there's a good chance you consider yourself a lifelong learner. However, you may not know about the University of Chicago's Graham School and its focus on continuing liberal and professional studies. For more than a century, Graham has been a destination for lifelong learners. They offer courses online and in the classroom, bringing the transformative education you Chicago is known for to students of all ages. To learn more about the courses, certificates, and degrees, visit graham.uchicago.edu. 
I've seen you talk about archaeology as statecraft. Mm -hmm. And especially when you are going to a part of the world that is filled with a lot of tension. Mm -hmm. What do you mean when you think about it? It's not just excavating in the history, but what what do you mean when you talk about the importance of it in relation to statecraft? Yeah, it's it's interesting. And I, I don't think many people have an appreciation for this. But really, um, what archaeologists and philologists that work in this part of the world... Um, what was that word to use? Philolo a philologist. So a philologist is somebody like me who studies texts, somebody who okay. works with words and studies the language. So when you work in these in these countries, it really is, I think, a, a unique example of, of cultural di diplomacy or really an exercise in soft in soft power. You think of other examples of cultural diplomacy. You think of, you know, the ping pong diplomacy before Nixon went, yep. went to China. You think of, you know, the great jazz ambassadors, Louis Armstrong and Duke Ellington went behind the, the Iron Curtain during the Cold War. And or the purpose in all of these um, endeavors is to have a positive cultural contact with an unknown or potentially hostile foreign entity and to have this, you know, bring out, to draw some humanity, common humanity between you and them, this idea of winning hearts and minds. When archaeologists and philologists work in these countries, we're really exposed to a, a really broad cross-section of these, of these cultures. So when we work in Nippur, we're working with villagers and local sheikhs. Um, we're employing workmen where we need cooks. We're, have, we have a lot of transactions with these people. They protect the sites. They protect us when we're there on a very local level. You deal with the local antiquities authorities, sort of the, the bureaucrats and administrators that work on a regional scale. But also you deal with the cultural ministers and the capitals and the, the, the highest level highest level people in the Ministry of Culture and Tourism who actually will approve your permit and allow you to work. So really you're, you're seeing everyone, right? You're seeing this cross section from you know diplomats and high level government officials all the way down to workmen and villagers. And this isn't a one-off contact. These excavations can go on for years, for decades, and mm. you really have, you gain this really intimate knowledge of, of the culture. And it's positive, right? You're working together. There's trust. There are bonds that you establish with these people. Um, you enable their lifestyles by employing them and they protect you and they allow you to so work there's there. So there's an appreciation for your seriousness of how you're taking the that's, culture. That's exactly it. These cultures are very old and they're very proud. And it's, I think, hard for Americans to sort of wrap their minds around the great antiquity of these civilizations and the pride they have in that antiquity. They know that this was the, the cradle of civilization. They're enormously proud of it. If you, um, if you drive through Baghdad, it's not uncommon to see cuneiform or mock cuneiform written on walls or depictions of Nebuchadnezzar or Hammurabi. They derive great pride in, in in their history, that this is where civilization began. And the fact that they've fallen on some very difficult times, I think they rely on that pride even more so. You know, we, we hear uh, you know, recently in the news, you know, make Iran great again, right? You know, this is an idea that says, I think for an Iranian, a very difficult concept to, to relate to in a, a civilization that uh, goes back over 2,000 years. Mm -hmm. So the, the people that we encounter in these countries, they're enormously grateful uh, for our interest in their culture. They appreciate what we're doing. They appreciate that we're making it known to the world. They appreciate that we're protecting their civilizations, the, these, their ancient heritage, that we have an investment. We have a personal and professional investment in their heritage. Um, and this is something that they've, they're, very, they're always very grateful for. They want us to be there in many cases. They want us to excavate there. They want us to make um, the splendors of their heritage known to the world. So it really is a very important partnership. We partner also with um, local scholars and conservators. We engage in um, cross-cultural um, exchanges. These cultural exchanges are investments that can pay massive dividends in the future. When Iraqis study in our country, they often return home to important positions of power and will hopefully remember their connections in America. Whenever um, we have the opportunity, because it's good for the fields, 
we want to engage in exchanges with the people in our in the countries in which we work. We want to train conservators. We want to train museum professionals. We want to train archaeologists because these fields will only succeed if they're protected in their own countries. We can't protect them. They need to live on. They need to have vibrant futures in the countries in which which this work takes place. The University of Chicago has been very good about this, and, and other universities have as well. You know, about 10 years ago, we were engaged in one of these exchanges, and we had a group of Iraqis come here to uh, to the University of Chicago. We gave them some conservation training. We met them. We showed them around. We gave them some advice on how you run a museum, um, how conservation and registration, things of this kind. I met a, a gentleman then. He was no one of importance at that time. His name is Abdul Amir Hamdani, and now he's cultural minister of the entire country, and he's the person who's responsible for giving us our permits, for protecting us, for allowing us to work and keeping us safe. And he remembers that trip 10 years ago. That's when I, I met him. So this is really a great example of how you know one good turn can do another, and you really need to play this, this long game. And you know, some of these people will go on. Maybe they won't work in the, uh, in the cultural ministry, but they may work in the oil ministry. And having this, or they may work in some other aspect of the sort of equivalent of the State Department in these in Iraq or in another country. But having this very positive exchange, having this positive uh, experience with Americans and with Westerners, goes a long goes a long way. It's a type of um, it's a type of cultural diplomacy. Another instance in which the OI is putting this idea of archaeological and cultural studies as statecraft into practice revolves around a controversial item from Iran. So we had a, a very complicated issue with what we call the Persepolis fortification tablets. Persepolis was the great Achaemenid capital, a ceremonial capital of the Achaemenid Empire. So you think of Xerxes and uh, Darius. And um, the OI excavated this site in the okay. 1930s. A very important group of tablets were found there, um, written in, well, many languages, but primarily Elamite, and they really speak to the inner workings of the empire, of the Achaemenid Empire. And it's really the best source for understanding the Achaemenid Empire that is indigenous. Um, these tablets came to the United States to, for study, came to the University of Chicago, to the OI in the 30s, and we've been studying them since then. They were the topic of a lawsuit against the Iranian government where they wanted to attach uh, Iranian assets in the United States. Hmm. There aren't any, there are very few Iranian assets in the United States uh, since the late 70s, but there were these tablets and this lawsuit rose to the Supreme Court. Um, we won that lawsuit last year in the Supreme Court that protected these tablets and prevented them from being sold on the market. And now we want to fulfill our obligation to bring these tablets back to Iran. But in the current climate, it's, it's fraught and quite difficult to do so. Uh, you need a, a license from the Treasury Department to bring them back. There are conditions of bringing them back. You need visas. It's very complicated. But we're looking, hopefully, if the political situation holds, to return the first batch of these tablets. They will go to um, the National Museum of Iran okay. in Tehran. Um, they need to go back in batches. So we, we're looking to return the first group of roughly 1,800 tablets um, back to Iran this fall. You know, in our work, you think that, you know, well, they, these projects, they go on for such long periods of, of time. They deal with antiquity. You think that, you know, it's, it's a very sort of staid endeavor. But really, our fields, they move very, very quickly because you're constantly adjusting to geopolitical Absolutely. events. So for decades, for instance, we worked in southern Iraq. That became impossible. People moved to Syria. Syria is not possible. Turkey is becoming an increasingly a difficult place to do work. But now southern Iraq is opening up again so we can work there again. So you're constantly adjusting to what the geopolitical situation is. If there is um, a conflict with Iran, it's terrible for our work in Iraq because the parts of Iraq that we work in, there's a strong um, Iranian presence. So uh, yeah, of course, we'd like to see things done differently. We'd love to see greater exchange. And really, the, these, um, the types of cultural contacts, this type of soft 
power, this cultural diplomacy that archaeologists engage in. We'd love to see more of that to really um, to, to really highlight this type of mutual understanding. James Henry Breasted said the ancient Middle East was the first data point for the human story. Another way to say that is it's the first chapter in our shared narrative. With all the conflict over the centuries, it's important to remember that we're all part of the same story. It's also worth reflecting on the words that Breasted wrote after World War I. Quote, the World War has now demonstrated the appalling possibilities of man's mechanical power of destruction. The only force that can successfully oppose it is the human conscience. Big Brains is a production of the U Chicago Podcast Network. If you like what you heard, please give us a review and a rating. Our show is hosted by Paul M. Rand and produced by me, Matt Hodap. Thanks for listening.